I always like to start out, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's an opportunity to come and serve God, to serve our Creator, the one that made us. We should send our praise back up to Him every day. One of the, one of the uh, verses that I really love, uh, you know, sometimes throughout your life you get life verses. And, uh, and then you get some more verses that become part of your life every day. And this is one of them, Psalm 48. This is an amplified version. It said, Great is the Lord and highly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, fair and beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion, the city of David, to the northern side, Mount Moriah and the temple, the whole city of the great king. One of the translations talks about that were uh, high and lifted up, fair and beautiful in situation. It used that word situation. But whether you situation, elevation, just think about that. To elevate, take, take our praises up to the Lord. That's what we need to do every day. You know, the Bible says we ought to look toward the hills for whence cometh our help. It's not the hills, it's the ones that created them. That's where we need to always look up to God. One of the things, we, we was just talking about it on the way over, there's so many people that, that, that don't have that revelation. They think they're all alone going through this work. We was uh, at a store, and, and these clerks was talking back and forth, uh, uh, kind of personal about the rent situation and other situations. And, and I remember the lady said, I'm all I got. I'm doing it all by myself. And I'm thinking, lady, no, no, well, I was getting ready to say something, but, you know, you you, you got to discern when to say things and when not to say things, you know. I'm going to just, you know, buy my old moon pie and leave. You know, that's all I'm going to do. But, 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 what, but I thought, no, 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 no. See, you got it wrong. You got it wrong. You are not by yourself. God is with you. Let us never forget that. You know, when, when, when Hagar got sent away uh, back with Abraham, you know, and she thought she was all by herself. God showed up. That's the thing. When we think we're all by ourselves, God shows up. He never leaves us or forsakes us. we we got to always remember that. And, and one thing we always want to remember is that there's people out there that really need the Lord. That's what they need. You think, man, their, their personality, they, they just seem to get all upset and they're angry about this and angry about that. You know, what they need is the Lord. They need the Lord because Jesus said, I give you peace that the world don't understand. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You know, and when our heart's troubled, that's when we need to go to the Lord and say, what's going on, Lord? We, we was thinking about that, too, that, that so many times when, when, when we get ourselves in trouble, we would have not been in trouble if we'd asked the Lord first. That, that's the problem. We do it backwards. What we tend to do, you know, instead of just asking the Lord, should I do this or should I not do this? Let the Lord guide you. The Lord can say, absolutely not. Don't do it. But sometimes we don't want to ask the Lord because He might say no. Right? Is that true? And it's something I really want to do. But God can say no. But I, I tell you, like Friday night we went out to... Uh, we had to do a night drive with the students. And I always pray over the night drive because any, in a second, things can change. So you got to decide. We had three in a truck, so you had to decide who to put first, who to put second, who to put third. And it makes a difference kind of where they're at, how they are in the training. And, and I put the individual second. And I tell you what, it was exactly the right thing to do. Because I asked God about that. Who should go? And I tell you what, we had a close call Friday. I mean, I, I needed somebody that just really could, really had good control and, and, and was kind of a, a re, more relaxed individual. I needed somebody right there because this vehicle decided to pass and didn't quite have enough room. And he's pulling a trailer. And we was on two lane road. It was close. And, and, and I just, I mean, we're, we're talking about a second here, second there, you know, and, and handle it right. Now I'm in there. See, the one thing about it is, is that you still have the instructor in there with the student, right? So you have my experience compared to his, with his, all right, to help him. And I thought, and we, we made everything, went fine. I said, you handle it exactly the way you should have handled it. You didn't panic, and I'm here with you to guide you. And I thought, that's it. That's really what God is with us the whole time. Yeah. And we just need to, and I, and I feel this really is a cry of God's heart so often. He just says, I wish the people would just believe me. Yes. That's absolutely the cry of his yes. heart so often. Yes. I mean, it goes clear back in the garden. Can you imagine every day, you know, God came walking in the cool of the day and wanted to fellowship, yes. wanted to talk to Adam and Eve. Yes. I mean, that would be awesome, absolutely, every day. Well, I tell you what, he 
can't get no closer when He lives inside of you. And He wants to commune with you every day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He just wants to be beside you and talk with you and say, how's your day going? How many times my, my uh, uh, middle daughter, one thing, she, if, 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 when she was a little girl, when you lie on the floor and watch, she'd have to be right up beside you. If you sat out, she had to be right beside you. You know, you turn around, she'd almost <laughs> bump into her. But she had to be everywhere you was at, you know. You know, she would like that. And I thought, you know, at first it, it's kind of hard to get used to that, somebody falling around. But she just wanted to be with you. Okay, that's what the example that Jesus set. Even in the midst of revival, even in the midst of healing, he had to slip away because he wanted to spend time with his father. I, I think that is so awesome to spend time because you don't want that line of communication broken. Right. Sometimes, you know, you just need to go to God, and I know I say this a lot, but just go to Him and spend the day and just say, Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's nothing wrong with asking, asking things of God, there's nothing. He rewards those that diligently seek Him. But I'm telling you, it's nice when you just say thank you. Lord, I just appreciate you. You know, great. You're great, Lord. Thank you for, for moving in this situation over here. Thank you for moving this situation here. Lord, help me to, to keep on trusting, keep on believing. I know it's, it's just things that don't look like it. there's much hope in there. But you know what? There's always hope in God. There's always hope in God. I know I say some of the same things often, but it's still the truth. You know, a lot of times people say, I don't know which way to go. And I tell them this, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus answered that question. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's the way to go. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, we're getting fired up, Pastor. We're getting fired up. The primer done started, buddy. The primer done started. <laughs> um, but no, I, I just want to share this and we're going to pray. But this is Steve Green's song, and, and just share a few verses. But it really touched my heart when I see people out there. There's so much stuff going on, but this is people need the Lord. Every day they pass me by, and I can see it in their eye. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. And they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. People need the Lord. That's it. That's it, folks. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, He's the open door. Hallelujah. When will we? That's what. That's what we. We got to realize that. When will we realize people need the Lord? That's what they need. All the turmoil and everything, they need to get a touch from God. That's what makes a difference in people's lives. They, they need something to get a hold of. I had an individual one time. And and, uh, and and he was in a program and he had a, 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 a two letters by his name. And I said, I said, well, what's the LC stand for? On the, and they said, initials? And they said, no, it means last chance. That's what it said. <laughs> it means last chance. I said, last chance. I'm thinking, no, no, no. You know, they asked me, he says, how many chances God give you? You know, people, people say, does it, they give you one chance, two chances? I said, and then after the second chance, you're done? I said, that ain't how it works. God gives us chance and chance and chance and chance and chance and chance because He still works with it. It could be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and 40 years. When your kid mess up one time, you don't throw him out. Say, hey, you better get your little, little Barbie suitcase. You're out of here. You know? <laughs> no, hey, you're out of here. You're only two years old, but we'll figure out the rest. No, you don't do that. You love that child. You set that child down and said, you know what? Here's the way we need to go. You know what? I'll love you no matter what. I don't want you to ever, ever doubt that. You know, the best thing you do is your kids never doubt whether you love them or not. And, and, and you love them doesn't mean they can act any way they want to act. You know, God's got some conduct for us. You know, and, and I tell you what, we need to be reflections of Christ in everything we do. See, I deal with driving all the time. And I tell you what, the ones that say, you know, got Jesus sticker on there, I'm, t I'm, just, I'm just saying you. I see some strange behavior out there, man. You know, I mean some strange behavior. I mean the honking and other things, you know, the, the hands waving in the air. They just need a few more things to be waving, you know, because they, I see some strange things. And they say, I love Jesus on the back of it. Well, they couldn't tell after that, let me tell you. 
You stop at the stop sign, we're going to duke it out. That's what we're to, you know, and so you're missing the point. What if that was the last time that person had an opportunity to be witness to? And you was up there yelling, throwing the fist at it, all that stuff. What was that the last time? You don't know. We're not promised tomorrow. So we need to act right today. Every single day. When people ask you, are you a Christian? It shouldn't be, well, you know, you know, you know, maybe, you know, I know, no, that's not the answer. Yes, I'm a Christian. I believe in the Lord. They say, Tim, are you a religious man? And I said, no, I'm not a religious man. I'm a spiritual man. There's a big difference right there. See, I believe in the one up here. I believe in Jesus Christ. He's the one that changed my life. That's why I'm different. That's why there's a light. And I all said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 When will we realize people need the Lord? We are called to take His light. To a world where wrong seems right. Ain't that the truth today? Boy, there's some strange things going on. What would be too great a cost for sharing life with one who's lost? I mean, what, what is the greatest cost here? Through his love, our hearts can feel all the grief they bear. They must hear the words of life only we can share. One of the best things you could do is tell your neighbor, your friends, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. And if you have an opportunity, hey, do you mind if I uh, share a few words out of the scripture with you? You know, if you mind, I do that. I mean, a lot of times people are open to Bible study. You know, I, I didn't quite understand the Bible. We kind of read it. Can, can you go over a few things? You bet I can. What do you think I'm here for? Why do you think your life is here at this point in time? That's what it's about. You know, when, when Jesus was in the temple at 12 years old, and they, and, they, and they thought he was in the caravan, they come back to get him. You know, and, and I mean, Mary and Joseph was not happy. They was parents. They was not happy. We're going to have a discussion there. We're not happy with you. You know, but you know what Jesus said? I didn't, at first, I didn't quite understand the answer, but it wasn't a smart aleck answer. It says, don't you know I must be about my father's business? He understood that. He was on the earth for a purpose. I must be about my father's business. And is that the way we are now? Is that the way we are now about our father's business? And that's what it's all about. It's about his business. It's about who you can lead to him. You know, and oh, hallelujah. All right. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize that we must give our lives for people need the Lord? Let's never forget that. People need the Lord. They need to hear God's praise. They need to see us praising the Lord and saying hallelujah. That's why I'm the way I am because I've been touched by God. Hallelujah. 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 All right. We're going to go ahead and open this up for prayer. I'm going to start. I'd like uh, prayers for my grandson. Uh, he's in the hospital and just uh, one, uh, out there in Oregon. I ask you to pray for him that God would just touch his life. A wonderful young man. He did give his heart to the Lord. I remember uh, at the church out there in Oregon, and, and he told his mom, and said, I'd like to go down. Mom's smart. Make it your choice, son. Want to make it your choice. Yeah. You walked down there and had an altar call. And you know what? He says, I'm going. And he went down there and gave his heart to the Lord. Yeah. Hallelujah. When your grandson gives heart to the Lord, I mean, you just praise the Lord. Yeah. And then he came back, and he said this. He said, you know, Mom, my heart doesn't hurt anymore. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. The heart doesn't hurt. There's been a change. Yes. And God always starts from the inside out. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. And God's got plans for that young man, so I ask for prayers from him. Yes. Hallelujah. Uh, and more prayer requests? Yes. Uh, so first of all, I'm very thankful for being here this morning. It's, it's good to be in the house of the Lord with your family. Hallelujah. I know I missed last Sunday. I had some prior engagement uh, in Cedar Rapids, but I'm back. Yes, uh, praise the Lord. So a couple of things. First of all, I'm very thankful for the Lord's blessings. Uh, our new house is going on. Good. Good, good. We finished. Uh, I had a schedule, which is good. Um, we're very excited about that. We're continuing to plan all the things that we're going to do. Uh, animals we're going to acquire. <laughs> to start a little homestead and whatnot, reading up a lot of caring for girls and things like that. So it's just very, it's very interesting and a lot of fun, actually. Uh, so we're very thankful for 
that. Uh, also for my family, uh, I'm very thankful for them, so continue prayer for them. Uh, you know, I know the Lord answered uh, prayers and you guys did with me when we prayed for both my sister and my nephew to be removed from that religious environment they were in in the church that they mm -hmm. were uh, members of. So that happened, so now I just pray that the door that the Lord has opened for them for where they're supposed to be to continue their calling, uh, they actually see it and walk through it. Um, prayers for my mother. Uh, she's having some issues with one of her legs, uh, kind of like a skin infection, but it's nothing too major, just prayer for it. Complete healing. Uh, every time that comes up, she's basically bedridden because uh, you can barely walk. Uh, also, prayers for my in laws. They are now officially retired. So they are down in Florida and joined life. Uh, so, prayer for God to bless them and keep them safe and for them to be able to now enjoy. This time that they're going to have together, relaxing and enjoying the fruit of the many years of labor they had, um, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to be being able to see them more frequently. Uh, it's, it's part of the plan at some point for the next maybe three years for them to move down here, so they're going to be closer. Uh, yeah. And the other thing. Uh, I don't know if you've, you've probably been watching this on the news, but there was a fire yesterday in uh, Trump Tower. Uh, I really don't talk about politics, and honestly, I really don't care much for the president. Anyway, uh, I pray that he does a good job, but that's about it. Uh, but it's really sad, uh, the amount of bareness and hate their ass towards this man. Uh, I don't have any feelings towards him. I mean, I think that he is doing what he feels is a good job for this country. I applaud him for that, for, for taking on such a huge task. Uh, you know, praying for the Lord to keep on um, giving wisdom for the decisions that he has to make and all that. But I don't hate the guy. I mean, I don't share some of his views, but you know, when you're when you're in a plane, you don't want the pilot to fail. Yeah. That's gonna Amen. happen. Exactly. Uh, everybody's gonna die. Right. Uh, but some of the things that people were saying yesterday on, on social media concerning this fire, it's it's really sad. Mm -hmm. And then people wonder why this country is so divided. Right. People were saying, "Oh, there's there's a fire in uh, Trump Tower. I hope that everybody's safe. But I'm actually a little happy about it." You know, and and. That says a lot about a person. It says a lot about their heart. And it goes back to what you said. People need the Lord. That's you know, right. Amen. Amen. When, when you have such a cloud in front of you that does not let you see past your own understanding, that's when you say things like that. And, and you can claim to be the most generous, best person in the world. Well, guess what? You're not. Right. Because you, do, you truly do not understand what compassion is. Unless you have experienced that from the one up above. Amen. Do you truly feel it in your heart that you have been forgiven? Amen. You have been taken into this family that we are a part of. Amen. When, when you truly experience that because you have repented wholeheartedly, like you said, your life has changed. Amen. And that's when you are being able to be empathetic. <clears throat> Towards others, Amen. and words like that are not going to come out of your mouth, because you know that the, there's power in the tongue. Yeah. Amen. So, yeah. uh, let's be the soldiers that we are called to be. And Susan and I were talking about this earlier today. Uh, this is going to be one of the main focuses for our house of prayer and pray. We are an army. We are God's army. That we put on the armor. Well, yeah. Why do you put on the armor? To protect yourself against what you're going to face when you go towards the front. And 
we need to continue to speak and declare what God said, pray, but most importantly, believe that the words that we are speaking are going to come to pass. Amen. Amen. That's good. Someone else, James. I am concerned over a friend that used to check on me, and he's in a bad shape right now, and I said, go out of shelter, and they literally beat people up. If they don't get their stuff stolen, so why you going to go and get them a padlock, and the guy ordered him to get a padlock, and get his stuff stolen. I mean, if that was me, I'd be scared to death. We can't have these shelters like this. Somebody's got to stand in the gap so innocent people don't get hurt. I'm very concerned over the condition in that shelter. They're going to let the people get knocked up. I had a friend I was with Jackie Malloy in a Bible study. Some guy came out there and they busted his nose in that shelter. And I know in the name of Jesus, somebody stands up in there so they don't allow that. That isn't the, the place to happen. And that happened in that shelter. And somebody needs to stand in the gap somewhere. Man. Not only Alan, you got a lot of people that come. You're not supposed to get beat up in a shelter. Right. But I'm really concerned over this. Yeah. So I bought him a padlock and I said, you make sure you keep your clothes locked up and don't say anything and then eventually you can get out of there. I think you want to get out of there if it's in that situation. Yes. But I, I'm concerned in all this negativity in the world, I just wish that people would look toward the positive and not, play well, I go into the news and all you hear is politics. They can't say anything nice about people. I mean, it's nice to hear the weather. I mean, it's going to change or it's going to change it. If God wants it to change, you can't do anything about it. we got to accept our responsibility is walking in God's footsteps and Amen. oil in the best of can be. Amen. And so what they're going to criticize you, they criticize Jesus falsely. You've got to down on the cross. We've got to take some of the heat. But uh, God's going to restore my ear a little by little. This is ridiculous. I don't know. Fashions and stuff that we, we don't claim this, but we have to suffer just like everybody else. But I'm thankful to be back. I got some of my degree back to graduate. Coming back is very hard to deal with this, but God's going to get me through this. Um, but I'm hoping that we stick up in a positive note for Mike Fox for under what reason that he comes back in God's glory and we really stand strong in Jesus to, to give him a good. doctors took 15 years off of her life, but she was like in her 20s when she got her kidney out. Um, I don't know if it was uh, 73. Uh, and, um, probably. you know, it's starting to, you know, take this toll and her thing is I do not, she does not want dialysis. Uh -huh. And um, they, they gave her the option of a kidney transplant. But with her, you know, she, she died there. Stand that, sir. 
Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. so true absolutely so true uh, if anybody else we'll just go ahead and stand please or stand for prayer hallelujah god you are good father god you do make all things new father god you are the wonderful father mighty counselor mighty god let us never, ever forget what you've done for us. Father God, you put breath in our bodies. You allow us to be here this morning. Hallelujah. Beautiful for elevation. Beautiful for situation. No matter what we are going through, that you are going to be with us. Hallelujah. Is there anything too hard for God? We know that the answer is no. The Bible says, for with God, all things are possible. Not some things, not a few things, but all things. Father God, we ask you, Lord, these prayer requests, we lift them up to you. Because right now we can go to the holies of holies. Hallelujah. Because when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was rent. And we could go right in the holies of holies, right to the throne of God. Oh, Father God, today we're going to lift lift this request up. Lord, that you would move in these situations. That you would do more than what we can even imagine or think. 
that the people will have to realize it's God that you did that, that you did this, that you moved in that situation. Father God, we ask you to use us daily, Lord. Let us be lights in this world. People need the Lord. Hallelujah. So many people need to hear from you. So many people need to have a hug from you and need to know that you love them with an everlasting love. Oh, Father God, you are God that forgives sins and you cast them in the sea of forgetfulness to never bring them up again. Oh, Father God, we thank you today that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Father God, Send your word, you never leave us or forsake us. And the glory goes to you. Glory to your name. Father God, send in your word, if you be lifted up, you draw all men unto you. And we're going to lift you up this morning. We're going to praise you this morning. We're going to just let your name, your, your name is above every name. It's the word. Hallelujah. Your word makes so much difference. The Bible starts in the beginning, God. Hallelujah. Because you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. We want to bless you today, Lord. The Bible says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Thank you, Jesus. You are so worthy, Lord. You are so worthy of praise, worthy of glory. Your name is holy. Hallelujah. The Bible says, be ye holy. Be ye holy. I am holy. That's what we need to do. It's always about holiness. It's always about your goodness. Let us spend time with you. Let us thank you, Lord, every day. Let us have that thankful heart. Hallelujah. Let us have that forgiving heart. Let us have that understanding heart. Let us always believe your word. Let us always choose you first. The Bible says, but seek ye first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. Lord, let us never forget that. That you love us with an everlasting love. Hallelujah. And Jeremiah, you have plans for us. Plans for our life to give us a future and a hope. Let us never forget that. And Lord, as we go in today's service, continue it, Lord, that your name would be lifted up. That miracles would be done. Because you are a God of miracles. You are a God can change a situation in an instant. Because you are God. You are the creator. You are able to do all things in Jesus Christ. It makes a difference. All you want for us is to trust us. Trust in you. Let us trust in you every single moment of our life. Let us call upon the Lord. Let us call upon the Lord. That's what it's all about. Putting you first. And we want to thank you, Lord. We want to praise you, Lord. For you are so wonderful. You are so mighty. And you are King of kings. Lord of lords. Let that get deep down in our heart. So we never forget. That you would watch over everybody in this congregation. The ones that couldn't be here. The ones that's here. Lord be with Michael. Lord be with the families. Lord be with the, the, the different situations in their life. Lord we ask you just put your arms around them. And let them know. Zephaniah says you rejoice over us with singing. Lord let us know. Let us, that, that, that we don't have to worry about a thing in that any doubt because you are with us. All you ask is that, that we trust you with all of our heart. Hallelujah. And, and, and said we need to put you first in everything we do. Love the Lord God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, everything within you. And let it begin every single morning that we trust you in your wonderful holy name. We pray, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Okay, announcements. Uh, please silence your cell phones. Still seeking media assistance, soundboard, scriptures. Uh, seeking Sunday school and youth group teachers. And uh, this Friday, and uh, April 13th, I know some... You know, try decaphobias, the ones against the blue. The fear of 13, don't let that fear. God made those days too, right? It's still God's day. But Eastern Gate House of Prayer, if anybody else wants to say anything about that? Roberta, you want to say? Yeah, so uh, the thing that both Suzanne and I feel uh, is what the Lord is leading us to. It's going back to our roots, going back to... Uh, the inspiration that has been given to us over the past years as we do our house of prayers to 
write and create our own music, our own sound, because that is going to be the, the true expression of what's on our hearts. Yeah. It's something that is being inspired and in us by the Holy Spirit, so that's where we're going to go. If you can come, I'm telling you, seriously, you come in kitty, you go out of line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You Let go and let God. You can be seated. If Eric and Tobe would come up or take an offering, I appreciate it. Mr. Eric, would be so kind to say a prayer, please. Father, once again, we are so blessed and thankful for this day. Lord, it's truly amazing that all we need is faith of a mustard seed just to believe in your faith, Jesus. We yes. are truly amazing. Things. All things are new each day. Yeah. Grace and mercy is new each day. Yes. We are so thankful for it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Have your way today, Lord. Bless this offering we're about to receive. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, worship team comes up. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I usually sit back and what am I going to say when I'm up here? And I was thinking about that this morning. Uh, for some odd reason, the thing that came to my mind was uh, the show The Voice. Anybody, anybody yes. here seen that? I like The Voice. I'm obsessed. Uh, the reason why I'm obsessed is I'm a musician and I'm a fan of music. To me, all music is wonderful. But the one thing that, that made me think of that is you see all these different people. They could be singing the same notes and they all sound different. Yeah. And that is to show you how wonderful God is. Mm -hmm. That He created us yeah. our His image. Yeah. We each have our own identity. Yes. That's to me is just true, undeniable proof mm -hmm. of His existence.
God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, that your presence is ever with us. You say you never leave us or forsake us, Lord. No matter how dark it may seem, your light is all around us, Lord. Praise God. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. Thank you, Lord, for your great love wherewith you have loved us, even given yourself for us. Praise God. We bless you this morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that although our faith isn't based on our feelings, yet you help us to feel your presence at times. And we're so grateful, Lord, of your reality in our lives. And we bless you this morning and give thanks to you and praise your holy name. And everybody said, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Amen. Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise God. Amen. God bless all of you for being here this morning. Thank you, Tim, for opening and sharing with us. Thank you, Roberto and worship team. Great job. Yes. Appreciate you all very much. Praise God. Good job. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. And I guess I don't need to dismiss anybody because they've bailed on us long ago. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God.
Thank the Lord. Amen. God is good. See, that's like a that's like an unwritten rule, isn't that what they call them? But of course, you realize unwritten rules are not worth the paper they're written on. So, don't pay any attention to them. Praise God. So, I had a pretty wild experience last week. I was hit by a rental car. It still hurts. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, well, apparently you're not ready for this transition, were you? <laughs> Thank the Lord. Amen. I'm doing much better. Remember the Alamo. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, well, God is good, and we're going to get right to the Word of God because they say it's going to snow, and I, I have my doubts that it will because they're such liars. <laughs> Forecasters are just... Oh, man. Well, they keep me prayed up, I can tell you that, but I just... It's everything but the weather. I mean, it's all entertainment. You know, I, I, I don't understand this because at times I'm home, you know, during the daytime. And they're uh, on Channel 13. They're at the Science Center and they have all these little kids. And they'll actually ask the kids, what do, what do you think the weather's going to be? And I thought, what do we need that person there for? Just let the kids tell us because they're going to be as accurate as any of the adults anyway. Now, I love kids, but not necessarily everybody else's. You know what I'm saying? So, I don't. Just give me the weather. Please. I know it's my thing, and I, you know, it's a hang up for me, but I'm telling you, they make me crazy. Literally. Praise the Lord. Okay, well, <clears throat> before we go to the first scripture, I just want to share some things with you as we get into this, just to kind of give you some more context to, with what we're dealing with this morning. But. I appreciate uh, Tim's opening because he did share some things that are, are re relevant to what I want to talk to you about, what I feel like the Holy Spirit's been dealing with me about. So, And that's always good. Good for me. Of course, we know that we all have the same spirit, so it's, it's a witness all the time that you know, he, the Holy Ghost shares back and forth with us. So. But if you remember the story of the prodigal son, and I'm not going to read it to you and all that because most of you all are probably familiar with it, but <clears throat> the prodigal son and the older brother. Well, in the older brother is this, you can call it evil disposition. It's a, it's a disposition of unbelief or distrust. Right? Remember, he's, he's, not, he's mad at his dad because his dad's doing something good for his brother. Right? Well, if there is a discrepancy between our lives and the fulfillment and the enjoyment of all that God has promised us, the fault is not God's. It's ours. Amen. If our experience isn't what God wants it to be, it's because of our unbelief in the love of God and in the power of God and in the reality of God's promises. God said, all that I have is thine. Now, we can either believe it or we can do like the elder son and say, well, you never gave me a goat. You know, I didn't get my thing. Right. It's because we didn't believe in the goodness of God to have it. Amen. He could have had it any time. The, 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 the father said, you could, you could have had a feast. You could have had a party any time you wanted. All you had to do was ask. Yeah. So this is the, you know, this is the uh, kind of the, the direction I want to go with this morning. And this isn't an accusation against anybody this is not I don't want anybody to feel like you're being condemned or judged or any of that but listen if we're going to have everything God wants us to have we need to we need to believe that he wants us to have it yes. I mean we need to believe in the love of God for each and every one of us yes. and that love is not based look I'm thinking about Karen talking about that little boy that nephew you know that kid is going to grow up to be an awesome young man because he's experienced the love of God right from the very beginning. Yes. Seeds have been sown. Yes. And he may, like all of us, deviate from that a little bit from time to time. <laughs> but that root will always bring him back home. Yes. It's like Tim was talking about his, his, his daughter, his firstborn. That she'd follow him around just right there. And if you stop and you're, boom, you, you know, they run into you. Just wants to be close. 
Well, that's not only true of how we should feel towards God, but it's exactly how God feels about us. Yes. Amen. So we want to we want to experience God in that way. We want to know God in that way because that's the only way we can really genuinely share Him with other people and be honest about it so that other people will want this same God that has come to us to be a part of their life. Amen? So, the problem is in us there's a struggle that goes on between what we see, what we experience in the natural, and what the promise is here of God. The only way to change what we're experiencing here in the natural is to believe in the love of God and the promises of God. It's the only way anything can change. It won't change by us just repeating what it is we're experiencing. Amen? I mean, we have to believe that God has something better for us. Amen. Praise the Lord. So let's go, uh, first of all, uh, Peter, if you will, let's go to Galatians chapter 4. And I want to read verses 22 through 31. And by the way, thanks, Peter, for stepping up and helping out with the... Uh, scriptures and the, all the technological things up there that I know absolutely nothing about. So, so he's, he's successful just for sitting right there right now as far as I'm concerned. Praise the Lord. So, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. He of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? Remember that word. These things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit. Even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Yes. Now, if you can, go back to... Uh, well, you don't have... He, he says... We'll just do it this way. He says, this is an allegory. This thing I'm telling you is an allegory. Now, we've talked about this a lot of times. I'm always talking about... This Bible is all written in allegories. It's all written in metaphors. It's, it's not just what you see on the surface. The, that surface truth is a truth. What he says here is true. But he's telling us something beyond what we're reading on the page. Yes. And that's what we don't, if we don't understand that, we don't ever get the spiritual significance of what it is God's trying to say to us. So I'm going to talk about some of those things, and it may twist your, uh, well, I won't say what I was going to say, but it may, it may make you uncomfortable, <laughs> praise the Lord. But I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable. I'm just trying to get us to open up our understanding a little bit and think about things in a little bit different way. Look, God is a good God. Yes. And Hey, I can be wrong, but even if I am wrong, I'm not afraid to be wrong because God can correct me and He's not going to, you know, burn me or fry me up here. So, you know, put the marshmallows away. We're good until after church. Praise the Lord. But an allegory. He said this is an allegory. Jesus always taught in parables. He always taught allegorically. And an allegory, just by... Definition from Webster's Dictionary, it says, it, an allegory is the description of one thing under the image of another. A story in which people, things, and happenings have a hidden or symbolic meaning. Which tells me right off the bat that when I read things in the Bible, there is more to this than what I'm reading intellectually. There is something symbolic, there's something uh, metaphorical, there's, there's something happening here that's hidden. Not hidden from me. God wants me to, to get it, but if I'm going to get it, I have to get it by the Holy Spirit. I have to look at things in a different way. Amen? So he says, it's a story in which people, things, and happenings have a hidden or symbolic meaning. And it's used for teaching or explaining ideas, moral principles. It's a symbolic narration or description. Yes. Now that, I mean, just think about it. All the Bible is this way. 
Because we know that every story we read, even though it may be historic and genealogical and everything else, there's another story there. There's more to it or else it wouldn't be in here because God didn't just give us this as a history book. He gave it to us because it's alive. It's a living word in order to lead us and to guide us into a deeper and deeper and deeper and more uh, fulfilling and intimate relationship with Himself. Amen? So with that in mind now, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God setteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Amen? So... We've talked about this a little bit in the past, and we're, just, we're, we're never going to get away from this until we are perfected. We've talked about this some Wednesday night. I, I preached a little bit on that. The fact that we are perfect, spiritually speaking, we are Jesus' twin. Spiritually. Physically, we got another issue going on. Praise the Lord. I mean, naturally, in the carnal. Amen. So it's not what you say. It's not what you profess that you are worshiping that is the real indicator amen remember the elder brother and the prodigal son I've served you all these years he says and I've never transgressed your commandments you go back and read it for yourself and he says but you never gave me a goat right God says hey it was yours all along you could have had it any time so he's worshiping something other than the Father. In other words, his intimacy is not with the Father. It's with the stuff. All right? All right, John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. And don't get me wrong, God wants you to have the stuff. It's yours. It's part of your inheritance. But this is about, about us and Him. It's about a spiritual relationship, first of all. So, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Alright, verse 20. I know I'm making you go backwards here. but Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. So this is the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, and she's saying, hey, you say we worship here... I'm saying we worship here, you know, there's this conflict, and we believe in the same God, and yet we think we're supposed to worship it in a different way. And Jesus said, look, where you worship isn't the issue. The issue is how you worship. And if you don't worship in spirit and truth, you're not really worshiping because He is a spirit. Right. So you, it, the fleshly stuff we do doesn't necessarily move God. It's from the heart. It's, it's what's going on inside of us. And then how, that, how we, how we react... react that's fine. There's nothing wrong with any of that. And God, it isn't that God is put off by it. It's just that what motivates us to do those things is what God's really interested in. It's, it's the heart, in other words. Amen? So worship isn't just lifting your hands and singing. It's yielding to God's Spirit in you. It's accepting that reality that he, you and He are one. That, that you are Spirit and He is Spirit. Amen? And that's, that's the thing. When you accept that reality... That is what destroys what we read here earlier, what opposes itself above what is called God, your flesh. So Pentecostally speaking, and, and I'm not you know, trying to ground you in that, I'm just saying that one of the benefits of that is it frees you from your flesh. Yes. Amen? Because our, it, some of the stuff we do would be embarrassing, yes. right? Right? But we don't care that it's embarrassing because we're not doing it about the flesh. This is about responding to the Spirit of God. That's the benefit from that. That's, that's what we're talking about. What that does is it overcomes that part of you that wants to just be, you know, I'm a, I'm a religious and I believe in God and, you know, that's it. No, it frees you from that so that you can let your spirit really begin to flow. And however that manifests, it just manifests. How it manifests is not the Spirit. It's what motivates you for that manifestation is, is what the Spirit is. 
And so, you know, we don't get hung up on the how we do that. It's, it's, we're hung up on why we do it. You know, if you're one person sitting here weeping, the next person's over here sitting next to you laughing. Same spirit, but that's how they're dealing with it. That's how they're dealing with that issue at that particular moment, okay? And that's still the spirit that's leading them, amen? That's what destroys that, that thing that oppo opposes itself above what is called God. That is the, the nature that pushes God aside and says, I'll do it my way. I know better than God knows. Okay? This struggle is all through the Old Testament. Two natures, Cain and Abel, Ishmael and Isaac, Esau and Jacob. You could say the same thing about the prodigal son and his older brother. And it's everywhere. It's just everywhere throughout the scripture. It's what Paul addresses in Galatians 4 that we read earlier and in other places where he talks about the bondwoman and the free woman. The, the bondservant, the slave child, and the free child. The promised child and the child that was by the flesh. Amen. So the war that goes on with Adam and, and Jesus in the minds of each of, a, of us. Yes. We are born again. We were born originally after Adam, the first Adam. Yes. Fleshly, natural, earthly. But we get born again from above. Yes. Amen. By the second Adam, yes. Jesus. And we are a new creature. We are yes. spiritually alive to God. But we still have a residue of Adam. And that's our unrenewed mind and our flesh. So the battle, the war goes on. The war continues between these two. Yes. Between Adam dominating and Christ dominating. Yes. And to be totally honest, we all know that Adam rears his head yes. several times a day. Yes. Amen. We have to be, and he looks a lot like me. Yes. Or you. Amen. He's imperfect. But there's a part of me that is absolutely perfect, righteous, holy, Jesus spiritual twin yes. and it's true of all of us that are born again the struggle is letting that rule yes. letting that identity dominate amen. amen doesn't mean you're unsaved because old Adam pops up every once in a while it just means you haven't totally yielded your members completely over there's somebody else trying to take the throne of the temple you are the temple of God yes. Jesus is seated in the temple of God. He's in your temple, amen. But there's a part of us that wants to say that, I want to be like God. I want to ascend. I want to be the one ruling in the temple. And that's what Paul is talking about in Galatians. That's also what they're talking about in 2 Thessalonians, amen, about this conflict. We, we push all that off into uh, Revelation, but Revelation is nothing more than a... A capsulization of this entire Bible. It's a revelation of Jesus. And unless we read this, and this is my point, unless we look at the scriptures allegorically, when we come to Revelation, it looks like a bizarre freak show. But if you have been looking at the scriptures allegorically all along, then when you get to the book of Revelation, you'll look at the book of Revelation allegorically instead of literal. Because the, still, the Holy Ghost is still teaching us the same way. Okay, so let's go to Genesis chapter 25, verses 21 through 26. Now, I'm not saying that what we read on the surface isn't true. I'm not trying to, I, I'm not trying to say that's not literal and it isn't valid. But I'm just saying that there's more here that God's trying to reveal to us. And that if we will yield to the Spirit, we can see greater truths that can impact our lives because you can go through the motions of being born again and go to heaven but about 75 percent of it will just be religious ritual so you'll never get closer to you'll never really get closer to god you'll never have the enemies you'll never have the capacity to believe in how much god loves you and how much he wants to give you and do for you because you'll always be measuring god's goodness based on your goodness, on your, you know, on, on your having earned His love, having done enough to get what it is you want to have. Amen? So here he says, Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. 
And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. After that came out his brother, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. Now here's another allegory inside of this woman, because when we talk about man, we're talking about mankind here, not gender specific, are two natures at war. Now, in the natural, it's because she's pregnant and she's got twins in there. Yeah. But allegorically, it's talking about something much greater than that. Right. That in everybody, there are these two natures. All right, so with that in mind, look at uh, verse 31 through 34, still in chapter 25. Jacob said, Sell me this day your birthright. Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. Why? Because he's been out hunting and he's hungry. He's not going to die. He's just uncomfortable. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? This is how little the birthright meant to him. And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So the word of the Lord came to Rebekah. There's a struggle in you. Two manner of people are in you. One of them is wild and hairy. I'm not sure quite where that fits in, but nevertheless. And does not love the birthright. The other is just the opposite. This wild, beastly nature is a part of us that would sell the birthright for a bowl of soup. Or for whatever our flesh wants at the moment. To react. Amen. To, to, to be just like Tim said. Honk if you love Jesus. And then you might get something you're not expecting if you can read between the lines. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Right? Why? Because in that person who loves Jesus is this wild beast as well. Yeah. Yes. Praise the Lord. That's why I try to avoid traffic as much as possible. And it's also why I don't have a bumper sticker that says pastor. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather fight for a parking lot or a parking space, amen, than to make a fool out of myself and have to go back and apologize to half of Des Moines because of five minutes of rant because somebody cut me off or flipped me the bird and for a moment I forget which Adam I am. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yes. And it happens. Yes. It happens in our personal relationships. It happens in our work relationships. It happens in all kinds of areas of our life. Okay, so praise the Lord. Rebecca is, is struggling with these two identities. Amen. And when these boys come out, it's a revelation of this warfare. Amen. And there's part of us that would sell out for anything. Just push the right button and I'm ready to walk away from it. Not that I don't want to be saved. It's just for a moment. I'm not thinking like Christ. I'm thinking like a human. I'm thinking like that hairy red guy. Amen. So you got Ishmael and Isaac, which is another type or another pattern, another metaphor, another allegory. Amen. Ishmael was born by human strength, by man's self-effort. And it looked like the promise, it acted like the promise, but it wasn't the promise. Ishmael had the heart of his Egyptian mother. Amen? That Egyptian, that unconnected heart was beating in him. Ishmael's name means wild ass. Wild and rebellious. Anybody that's ever messed with donkeys or mules know... Hey, you think horses can be a problem? Those things do what they want to do. 
You, you can beat them to death, and it's like the old cliche, it's like beating a dead horse. That's like beating a mule, because they're only going to do what they want to do. If, you, if they're not trained, no matter what you do, you're not going to make them do it. they got to want to do it. you got to give them a reason to want to do it. Amen? So anyhow, this is, this is the struggle that's going on here. Ishmael was this rebellious, wild, could not be heir of the promise. Because he was physically produced. Isaac's birth was supernatural. Isaac was the promise. Yes. The son of the bondwoman mocks the son of the free woman. Yes. The, that, that wild side in you yes. wants to make the real you look like a jerk. Amen. I mean, we've had to, we all have had to deal with that at times. You get it and you go, whoa, was that really me? And man, I hope nobody saw that. I hope nobody heard that. I hope nobody that knows me saw that or heard that. Amen. But the one that will never be heir will still always struggle with the promised seed of God. Yes. It can never be, but it won't give up. It'll keep harassing you and keep fooling with you and messing with you. Amen. So God is doing a supernatural work that is impossible for humans to produce. Yes. You can't make it happen. You can't ever get good enough for this to happen. It has just been done by the grace of God. The grace empowers us. It gives us the ability, amen, to become the promised seed. Yes. Amen. That's what Jesus did. Praise the Lord. He made us the promised child. Yes. Yes. So the Bible is filled with the struggles of these two Men, Cain and Abel, Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, Jacob, the prodigal and his older brother. Look at uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 11. Now I'm saying all this, this is valid, this is, re this is necessary, but I'm, I'm trying to, I'm going to get past this in a minute so that you'll, if you don't believe this, you're not going to, I guarantee you won't believe where I'm going. Praise the Lord. So know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin, or that flesh. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Yes. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin or unto the flesh, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when that lying old Adam comes along, you've got to reckon, amen, that's dead. He may, not be, he may be trying to act like he's not dead, but he's dead as far as God and I are concerned. I'm the, the Jesus part of me is the only thing that's alive. Amen. Praise the Lord. So it, it can... This, this battle, this struggle continues to this day until we come to the revelation where we reckon the old man that's in us is dead. Yes. You get, and that comes by the renewing of your mind. It comes by the Word of God, believing the promises of God, the love that God has for you. Amen? Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. So the struggle is going to continue until there is a resurrection, or as the Scripture said that we read earlier, an appearing in us. Amen? Praise the Lord. Tell the birthright rules. All right. Hebrews chapter 10, 12 through 14. Hebrews 10, 12 through 14. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Now, now that scripture is one of those, it's, it's kind of like, the, you know, uh, he's victorious and yet there's still battles. To, that's, this is henceforth expecting till his enemies be.
be made his footstool. He had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. The enemy's defeated. Satan is a loser. He's, he's been defeated by Jesus. Amen. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. So what is this about expecting till his enemies be made his footstool? You would think logically would tell us they already got to be his footstool. He's already put his heel on the serpent's head, right? He's already fulfilled that prophecy all the way from Gen back from Genesis. And yet, there's something is, this, his enemies have to be made his footstool. That's what we do. It's by believing that we enforce, okay, what are, what are his enemies? Sickness, disease, poverty, ignorance, uh, you know, rebellion, uh, hateful, you know, all these kind of things. Those are the enemies yep. that he already defeated at the cross. Yes. But we put them under the footstool by accepting who we are in Christ and not yes. yielding or giving in to the enemy, amen, of our soul, amen, that other man, that old Adam. Yes. Is that making sense to you? Praise the Lord. So, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Our spirits are sanctified. They have already been set apart. God's already inhabiting our spirits. We and he are one. We've been set apart. That's what sanctified means. Therefore, we have been perfected. We know that we're perfected because God could not cohabitate with anything that was imperfect. Our spirit has to be perfect or God could not reside. We could not be one with God because God will not abide sin. So our sin has been dealt with. It's this old nature that still tries to dominate, still tries to pretend like it's a spiritual force when it's nothing more than natural. It has to be made a footstool. Praise the Lord. Verse 22 and 23. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. That's, that's what we do. And this isn't physical. We, you know, this is about believing what God has already declared. Believing that we are sanctified, that we are righteous, that we are holy. That we are perfect. Amen. Hold that profession. Because when that ugly thing pops up and wants to tell you this is who you are, you've you got to have a response. Praise the Lord. Because even if you get into it for a moment, you've got to remember, hey, wait, whoa, 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 that's not me. Because eventually, if we continue to focus on this, it will dominate. It will overcome. It will make that other thing a footstool. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's go, and I, we're ready. Let's just move into this. All right, Luke chapter 17, and I want to read verses 34 through 37. Now remember, allegories. This is allegorical. The Holy Ghost is allegorical. He teaches that way. He even speaks to us that way. That's why sometimes it doesn't make any sense when he speaks to us because we're trying to rationalize everything. And he's telling us something that doesn't make sense in the natural. Amen? You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And you're thinking, man, I couldn't even get through the first 15 minutes of the morning without screwing it up. In Christ you can, praise the Lord. So, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. One will be taken, the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Now, that whole thing always kind of confused me, but that last verse especially, and I did some word searching, and let me just, before I go any further with this, let me just say, first of all, where it says, wherever the body is, that word body is from a root word that means slave or flesh. So wherever the slave is or wherever the flesh is, amen, the eagles will be gathered. One translation says the vultures. But the root word, the, 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 the more perfect translation says the root word for that eagle is Maranatha. Because it's talking about a wind. It's talking about an unforced wind. 
you know, in other words, it isn't an exhale, it's just something, uh, air that's there. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a live, breathing thing, okay? It's called Maranatha. What does that mean? The appearance of the Lord. So wherever the flesh is, he's speaking about us now, because, and I'll show you that, the context in which he's speaking, he's talking about us. Wherever the flesh is, wherever the body is, the flesh, there is also an appearing of the Lord. There is a Maranatha, okay? Now, so let's think about this. All the things we've been talking about here. This isn't talking about two men in a bed. Any more than it's talking about two women grinding corn or meal or whatever it is. So it's not talking about a man and his wife. It says two men. It's talking about schizophrenic Christians. Dual nature. Yes. Split personality. Sweet one minute. Hateful the next. Yes. Believing for everything one minute. And doubting everything the next. Right. Trusting in the goodness of God one minute. And then thinking, why has he abandoned me? Yeah. It's a dual nature. Praise the Lord. It's the ability to display both good and evil. I didn't think I'd get an amen, but you don't have to amen because I know y'all. I'm one of you. Praise the Lord. Two in the bed. One's going to be taken and the other's going to be left. So here's the deal. I'm not going to give you my old theology or ask you what yours was. Let me just share this. How about the one taken away isn't the nature of Christ, but it's the beast nature. It's the flesh nature. It's the first Adam nature. Not two people, but two natures operating in us. Allegorical. We want to take it literal, but... Not two people, two natures. So what the Lord is doing in, is... Appearing. And what is He doing in the day of His appearing? 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 4. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus, the appearing, and by our gathering together unto Him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit or by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of, the, of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you, by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Uh -huh. Something has to go away yes. in order for there to be an appearing. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Yes. Who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You are, no you not, you are the temple of God. There's something in us that wants to be seated in the place that only Jesus is truly seated. He has to be fallen away. He has to go away. He has to go somewhere else in order for there to be an appearing of Jesus. Because they don't go on at the same time. You're not acting like a heathen or an idiot and acting like Jesus at the same time. You can act like Jesus and you can act like the idiot, but not at the same time. One is going to rule. One is going to dominate. One is seated in that position and the other one isn't. Amen. So here he's referring to the presence of the Lord. Amen. Not two men, but two natures. Because you are the temple of God. It explains that. Yes. It, 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 it shows you the context in which he's speaking. Amen? So, think about it. You go home today. Go through the day. Time for bed. You go to bed. And if you're struggling with Esau and Jacob, Ishmael and Isaac, Cain and Abel, first Adam, second Adam, there are two men in the bed. There are two women in the bed. Right? I mean, there's two personalities, there's two characteristics, there's two things going on, amen, in that bed. Yes. May just be one body, amen, but there are two natures. Yes. Two men. Yes. 
Praise the Lord. The Lord is appearing in our lives that He might destroy the man of sin. How does He do it? By the brightness of His coming and the spirit of His mouth, the Word of God. Hallelujah. When we lift Him up, when we worship Him, when we make Him, amen, seated, when we seat Him in the temple and we speak His Word, amen, we destroy the man of sin. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay, look at now let me show you something. Luke, Luke 17 and verse 20. Luke 17 and verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Now, remember this because now we're going to continue reading on. But what happens is we read on from there and we forget the context in which we're reading everything that we're reading. We're reading in the context of the kingdom coming or where the kingdom is, right? So he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was going to come. And he answers them and he says, The kingdom of God doesn't come with observation. It's, in other words, it's not geographic. It's inside you. He says it's low. It's not here low. It's not there. But it's inside you. The kingdom of God is within you. Inside you when Jesus is Lord. Praise the Lord. When truth dominates, the kingdom rules. You see what I'm saying? So we wonder why, because everything that we have need of is in the kingdom. So why are we inconsistently receiving from the kingdom? Because sometimes the kingdom's in us, and sometimes the kingdom ain't in us. You know what I'm saying? It isn't like it isn't in us, it's just that it's not ruling, it's not dominating. It's, it's not the truth that we're really believing, because we're believing a lie at the moment. We're, we're believing in a doctor's report. We're believing in a bank re report. We're believing in what some lawyer said. We're believing in what I'm feeling in my body. I'm believing the argument that this demon that, you know, that comes along every once in a while, that old Adam, is trying to tell me. Yeah. You're not going to get it. You're not good enough. You haven't, you haven't gotten it yet. You're never going to get it. Why? Because there's this thing going on in me all the time and nobody ever really wins. Right. Yeah. Spiritually, I'm already more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. And my name is written in glory. I'm going to heaven. But we're talking about here and now and how are we going to dominate in this life? How are we going to influence in this world? Yeah. Praise the Lord. So, Luke 17 and verse 26. Again, we're talking about the kingdom here. That's the, the, the context in which this is all being spoken of. Because if you, you know the scriptures, there were no, when this was written, there weren't any chapters and verses. It was just continuous writing. So, this, but you had, so that you had to look at the context to know where are we in this conversation. Just like if you're having a conversation with somebody else. If you're having a conversation with my wife, it might freak you out because sometimes she'll start the conversation in the middle because she's been having the conversation in her mind and then she'll just start talking to me out of that conversation that I'm not a part of and I'll go I have no idea what you're talking about I know I mean I feel like a complete idiot I'm thinking why where where did that come from right it, it, you know so sometimes we do that you know we just know what we're thinking and so we just say it and we expect they well they're on the same page and they have no idea what in the world we're even doing. It's not her fault, but I'm just saying. So as it was in the day of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Again, we're dealing with the kingdom in you, right? That's the context of these scriptures. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. Verse 27. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Praise the Lord. Who was them all that the flood destroyed? The wicked were destroyed. Yes. Yes. Jesus says the same thing is going to take place in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. When Jesus appears in His temple, the wicked are destroyed. You know, I'm not talking about something that's going to happen in 2050 or whenever. It can happen today. It can happen tomorrow. It, it, it'll happen for you one way and it'll happen for me another, you know, at a different time maybe. But it happens the same way. 
it'll happen just like it happened in the days of Noah. The righteous will be lifted up and the evil will be destroyed. Praise the Lord. Verse 28 and 29. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Now again, that happened. I'm not denying that. I'm not trying to take away from the validity of this statement. But I'm saying it's also an allegory. So God's trying to tell us something else besides a history lesson. So shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. I'll say, the wicked are destroyed from off the earth. Right? Fire, and they were destroyed. The wicked were destroyed, right? They were taken away from existence. They don't, they're not there anymore. They're gone. Right? All right. Verse 30. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So shall it be in the days of the Son of Man who is now being revealed in our lives. Right now. Praise the Lord. It is the man of sin that is judged. Not you. The man of sin. All right, verse 31. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop. Now, can you see how everything in the scripture could change? And I'm not trying to just force things into stuff and don't do that. But I'm saying, if you just use this as the template, you'll see the Holy Ghost is teaching this way all the time. So in that day, he, he which shall be upon the housetop, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Now the point of the verse is not returning back. Yes. Right? Yes. That's just basic English, you know, subjects and so. So he's just saying, the point here is, don't go back. Because... The next verse says, remember Lot's wife. Yes. Yes. What was her problem? She went back. She did. She so there's a, a powerful spiritual uh-huh. revelation here, a connotation in this verse. It's an allegory. Uh-huh. And he's telling us that it is you and I who are on the housetop. God's spiritual house. Now this just freaks me out, but look, just, just look at this now from that perspective. Hebrews 6 and 1, where we read earlier. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance. In other words, not going back and rebuilding the foundation. The foundation's great. We've got to have the foundation, but we've got to move on from that. We can't keep going back to it. Right. Got to move on, right? So not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. And, and then it goes on, but that's enough to get us to understand. That's the foundation. Okay? All right. Acts chapter 1 and verse 13. When they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon of Salotis and Judas, the brother of James. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now they're in an upper room. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place in that upper room. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, if they had gone back to the foundation, they would be something else besides Holy Ghost filled. 
pick a denomination, I don't care what it is, but I'm, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just saying they would not have that experience had they gone back. And that's what he's talking about. Don't go back. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right. Jesus. Hebrews 6 and 1 says, let us go on to perfection, yes. to maturity. Yes. Amen. All right. Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 15. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew an eye unto the city, Peter went up on the housetop yes, to pray about the sixth hour. Not in an upper room, now he's on the roof. Yes. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Uh -huh. And he saw heaven opened, uh -huh. and a certain vessel descending upon him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, No, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God has cleansed, that call not common. God has cleansed you. Amen. And we're still calling it common sometimes because it rears its ugly head and we believe that to be our reality instead of the truth of who we are. We're supposed to be on the rooftop, but we keep going back down to the cellar. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Open heaven. You get to the rooftop, you got open heaven. Yes. Now, we can talk about the people that are in the foundation, but the people on the rooftop are talking about us that are still in the upper room. Yes. Because all God is saying, just keep on going. Because there is a place of perfection. There is a place of completion, amen, of, uh, of uh, totality in God. But you've got to keep moving on. You can't keep going back and want to have that Pentecostal revival. Praise the Lord for your Pentecostal revival. You want to go? I'm not interested because I've already been there. I'm not against it. I'm just saying that Pentecostal revival is for somebody that's in the foundation, not for somebody that's on the rooftop. Praise the Lord. You see what I'm saying? I'm not against any of that. I'm just saying, if you've been there, you've received it, God's trying to get you to come up a little higher, like it says in the book of Revelation. Come on up. You know, he's, he's got something more for you. You needed that so that you could take the next step. You can't jump from the foundation to the rooftop. You just take the stairs to the upper room. God will meet you there. Then you can get to the rooftop. Then there's an open heaven. Praise the Lord. Nehemiah 8 and 16. Praise God. See, this is, I mean, this is supposed to free us. We're supposed to be liberated. We're supposed to be not stuck in something that we're trying to recreate something over and over. We're supposed to be moving on. We're supposed to have, there's supposed to be an expectation, an anticipation for something greater. Yes. We need a, a footstool. Amen. And keep on going up. Praise the Lord. For there were many in Judah sworn unto, unto him. Because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, and his son, John, Johanan, had taken the daughter. This is not the, the right scripture, I'm sorry. 16. Yeah. Uh, we're still not there. Nehemiah 8, yeah, Nehemiah. eight, eight sorry. verse 16. Now again, allegories. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, everyone upon the roof of his house. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And in their courts, in the courts of the house of God, and in the streets of the water gate, and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. So they come out to the rooftops. Why? To celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Yes. Tabernacles is after Pentecost. Yes. He's talking about moving past the upper room. This, this is thousands of years ago, God had this plan. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. So he's saying, Pentecost is back there. Don't go back. We've got a rooftop thing coming. We've got another party to go to, and it's up on the roof. Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Moving beyond Pentecost. Yes, Lord. More of God. Yes. 
I mean, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a denominal church that really didn't even preach much about salvation other than just there is a God. When I went into, got into Pentecost, it was awesome. I was paranoid about it. I was always kind of, you know, uncomfortable with it because we always thought they were the nutcases. You know, they were the weirdos. Then, till I became one. Till I became one of the weirdos and one of the nutcases. Then I realized how much freedom came with that and how much intimacy there was with God that I had never known before. He just was. Now all of a sudden he became more personal, more real, more interactive, if you will. See what I'm saying? Well, he's telling us, he's saying to me, Nathan, you know the, the difference between that and that? There's a big difference between this and the next thing. And there's even more beyond that if you will just keep moving forward if you'll just keep going forward and not turn back think about it the reason the churches are where they are today is because we got to one place and just stayed there that's why we got all the denominations we've got right now people came to a certain place and said that's it that's the truth now I'm not moving from here because it's spooky once you get past this because this is what I know this is what mama knew this is what daddy knew this is what everybody I've ever been around knew Praise the Lord. But there's more. There's stuff that we haven't even dreamed of. He said He wants to give us things that hasn't even come to our mind to imagine, to ask for yet. And He's already got it laid up for us. Think about grace itself. Yes, Sally. We think this is the end all and the be all. This is the great awakening. This, this I mean, for me. Because I come out of religion. I came out of a great truth of God that was a great blessing to me but it was also a type of bondage because I had to do a lot of stuff to stay in right standing grace comes along and tells us that's not what it's about it's very liberating but grace is just to open the door to what God really wants us to do and be and to experience praise the Lord we want to go to the rooftop not come down or turn back from an open heaven to a foundation. Right. Hebrews 6 and 1 again. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance and from dead works and faith toward God. What did he say? Remember Lot's wife. Praise the Lord. Luke 17, again, verses 31 and 32. About done. Praise the Lord. Luke 17, 31 and 32. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. It's not the righteous that are taken out. It's the wicked. Yes. So I don't know. That's not the way I heard it. All right. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Proverbs 10, verse 30. The righteous shall never be removed, but the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. <clears throat> Psalms 37 and 9. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Yes. Yes. Psalms 37, verse 11. Amen. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Verse 29. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Yes. Yep. Praise God. Yes. So this mystery of iniquity operates in those who do not receive a love for the truth. The truth of who we are in Christ. Not the lie of who we are in Adam. 
The wicked one whom the Lord consumes with the spirit of His mouth, with the Word of God, with the brightness of His coming. He's being revealed in us. He's coming to His temple. Temple, who you are. Praise the Lord. Last scripture. Hebrews 5, 9 through 14. We're closing with this. Hebrews 5, 9 through 14. Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. Called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God or the word of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Praise the Lord. He's talking to Hebrews. He's talking to people that are so entrenched in the law that they can't see themselves as being the righteousness of God in Christ. They, they, they keep wanting to go back and do the, the rituals, the, the legalism, the, so on and so forth. And he said, only if you move forward, only if you can move past that to this truth. He said, I, I, I want to tell you more, but I can't because you're still struggling with just being born again. But if you can get past it, there is a place where you can be, your senses can be exercised so that you can discern what's Adam and what's Jesus. Praise the Lord. That's where He's got us. That's where He has us. That's where He wants us to live our lives. That will put His enemies under His footstool. And that will give us the kingdom of God dwelling in us. Wherever we go, we experience the kingdom. We can have our healing. We can have our breakthroughs. We can have the financial breakthroughs. We can have the deliverance. We can have those things that we have to have. But you know as well as I do, the thing we struggle with is we've got a promise from God, but the stuff isn't happened. And we think, well, I did this and I've done that and I've done... Yeah, and you're still listening to somebody who's saying, it won't ever happen for you. You're not good enough. You screw up too much. You don't believe. Look how it's happening for this person. It's not happening for you. Yeah. At some point, we've got to move on up. Yeah. You know, we've got to just let go and let God. Yeah. Just like it says it up Amen. here, you know. It's a challenge. Amen? But it's about renewing your mind. That's the discipline. That's the only real discipline that there is. You've got to believe what He said and stop believing what your own flesh is telling you. Praise the Lord. There's an open heaven waiting for us. We get to the rooftop. Amen. Don't go back for the stuff. Don't go back what's on the first floor. Don't go back for the stuff you left downstairs. Amen. Praise God. Just stay right where you're at and look up. There's another floor. There's another place. There's another realm for us to operate in. We taste it every once in a while. When we get a breakthrough, when somebody gets healed, when, when we see something happen, we, we, we get a breakthrough. We see it. We see an open heaven for a moment. We see what heaven has for us. And God wants us to live that reality every single day, all day long. Praise the Lord. Give Him a hand clap. Praise God. Amen. So we got to think outside the box. We got to think outside the house. Praise the Lord, because there's something much greater for us. We can just let go of what it is we've been hanging on to. Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate you being here. Great to see Karen back. God bless you, Karen. Believing for some great breakthroughs for you and your family, and uh, everybody. Just believe God, and let's let's get to the next level. Praise the Lord. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.